Yes, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Very well, yes. very well. Yes. yes, welcome to tonight's uh, Samrak Book Club meeting. Uh, tonight we are uh, privileged to have uh, our guest speaker, Stella Kinama, all the way from Houston, Texas. In the book she will be reading for us or discussing uh, with us is The Abused Queen. Uh, welcome very much, uh, Stella Kinama. Um, thank you. you. Pick it up from here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You ready for me? Uh, yes. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for having me. My name is Stella Kainama, like you have said, uh, like Sam has said, and um, I live in Houston, Texas. I am a mom of one daughter, eight year old. And I do speak, especially on Facebook, every Sunday at 3 p.m. And I, I have written uh, the book, The Abused Queen. This is what we're gonna be discussing today. So that's me in a nutshell. Oh, very, very good. Um, later on, we'll welcome questions uh, from the book. But you could just tell us a little bit about the book, why you wrote the book, um, what's inside the book. I've read the book, I've heard you speak about the book, um, but you can just give us your personal story, uh, what's behind you writing this book and uh, what kept you going. Uh, if you are to write a second and a third book, what would you change, what would you not change, uh, that kind of thing. And I love the color of the book, purple. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so I don't know if I would, I, I would say it's really not a book, it's my testimony. To, it, it, it had to be written in, a, in such a format. So it is a book to you, but for me, this is my life story. Uh, a story I'm not particularly, <laughs> you know, proud of. It was a painful situation. So um, it was published and written in 20, 18, that's when I wrote the book, uh, July, towards the end of July. But the actual situation happened in my marriage that started in 2009 to 2013. And I was um, in a marriage, I was in America, in uh, the Southern parts, I'm gonna refrain from using the actual um, people's names and places. So uh, that's, I was in America and I had just come in America and uh, like most of you know, it's usually not that, it's not what you expect when you first get here. And so I didn't know anybody and it was quite tough to get started, but along the way I met and got uh, into a relationship if I may put that into, um, you know, quotation, because it was no kind of that relationship, but it added in there. So for you to know the actual story, you're gonna have to read the book, but I'll, I'll paraphrase it, I'll summarize it so you know where it's coming from. So that's when I met this guy, cool guy, nice looking guy, and we started hanging out and we did, we did start living together. And when that happened, I grew up with a single mom. She, my dad passed when I was very young, like nine or 10. So the idea of a family, how a man and a wife stays was not, you know, I didn't have that picture. I just knew abuse is when you slap someone, when you push someone, when you use physical force. But because that didn't happen immediately, I didn't quite get it. It started with the mental, it started with the, with the uh, psychological abuse. And in a way, um, I didn't know what was going on. I've never seen anybody being abused. And if I, when I was in the village growing up, I could hear women in the neighborhood, especially when their husbands come home drunk, you hear somebody screaming. And so there was physical force exercised, but because there was no physical situation, there was no hitting, there was no slapping, there was, there was actually no verbal, verbal insults. 
initially until way later. And so I didn't know that I was in an abusing situation. And because of our culture, the way um, our culture is set up, uh, you know, we say how women are supposed to hold on to their, uh, you know, secrets, whatever is going on in your home, you're supposed to, you know what, shut it up, you know, deal with it your own way. I didn't know who to talk to. My whole family is in Kenya. I had a friend and she's never been married. And I, even when I shared, she could quite understand, you know, so she couldn't advise me on what to do or whether this is abuse until, and I was in nursing school then. And in the class one day, the, our teacher described what signs of abuse are. And every one she mentioned meant, especially the psychological mental abuse, it was, it was feeling, I was like checking every one of them. Oh my God, I'm experiencing all these things. You mean I'm in an abusive home? And I was obviously shocked from within, but I couldn't still share with anybody, especially because there was no physical. And our culture, the way we, we believe is if he's not hitting you, if he's not doing anything that will harm you, then you should, you know, you should vomilia, you know, hold on to the horses and keep on going. It might get better if you change, things will change, things will get better. And so I kept, I kept it to myself. When I talked to my mom about my marriage, I would just tell her all the sweet, sweet stuff because I didn't want her to worry. What I know now is I should have told her exactly the truth. She would have advised me on which way to go. But I, I hid all this from her. I hid all this from the people around me. I didn't know who to trust. I didn't know who to share with. I didn't want to be labeled that I'm being abused. And I, I kind of didn't want people to know what is going on because we hide. It's shameful to be in an abusive home. We feel shameful that we want people to believe we are being treated like queens and kings. So when it happens, you feel the need to hide. So that's what I did. And eventually, uh, to cut the whole story short, is eventually, four years down the line, that's when the actual action started happening. And so um, that's when he slapped me for the first time. Four years. It took four years for, for the actual uh, physical abuse to, to happen. And so this book is, is telling about how that happened step by step, how we got together, how we, I started seeing signs, how I didn't communicate with anybody and how I held on to my horses, hoping things will get better, hoping that I can handle it. I was thinking all the homes, anybody I spoke to said, what are you talking about? Even after he slapped me and I left, I left the home, I left the marriage. All this time, there's no child, there's no kid involved. But when he slapped, that's when I, I felt now, oh, now I have the right to leave. And so looking back, I feel like, was I waiting for this to happen so I can justify my leaving? Like, I felt like I needed something more tragic to happen, like something physical to happen so I can explain to people why I'm leaving my marriage. So there was that fear of being judged. There was that fear of people thinking, why couldn't you, you know, be strong and handle your marriage? All marriages are, have issues. And so I felt like now that he hit me, I guess I, I can leave. And I left. But um, not for long, <laughs> unfortunately. Or fortunately, I don't know. But anyway, soon or later, he talked me into going back. He called everybody. He called my family. He called all my friends. And they all talked me to believing that this is a one-time occurrence, it will never happen again, and I should give him a second chance. And so, of course, I did give him a second chance, and that was 2012, 2011, I think 2011, yeah. So, uh, two years down the line, I'm pregnant, and I'm in nursing school, in the program, nursing program, and now, there is, there's always commotion. There's always some commotion here and there. And then we settle it, another one comes, just like many marriages. But then when we settle down, nothing changes. We just come down for a while and it repeats again. All this time, there's really no hearing. There's no 
physical. But then it got to a place where he, he now, he started uh, acting like, uh, especially when he realized I'm pregnant and he felt like, okay, now she's here to stay. And even if she leave, um, I can still get, you know, hold of her because there's a kid involved, you know, according to the laws in America. And so that's when I realized, man, uh, the way he's acting, he was a little more aggressive than normal. The way he's speaking, he, he feels he, he's threatening in a way, talking about no one else can ever raise my child. And I'm like, it's coming from nowhere. There's no, no altercation or no other situation that is showing him that, but he can sense that I have had enough and chances are I'm gonna try to leave. And so he's saying these things to scare me, you know, tell me, oh, listen, uh, no one else is gonna raise my child. So just so you know, don't even try, you know? And so of course it put fear in me and I had to really pray and ask God, how do I even get out of this situation? Because it's no longer a marriage. It feels like a, like a jail. It feels like a prison cell. Like somewhere I've been in a box and I have to do this when he want me to and raise and there's a child involved. And so whatever I have to do, whatever decision I have to do, I have to put in mind that there's a child involved. So anyway, I had a friend who was a mutual friend and I was sharing all this with her. She's a little old. She's not a little older. She was like 52. We were in our early 30s, uh, 30 actually. And so I felt like she was a mother figure. I used to work with her. And so she, I used to share with her what's going on, you know, and she would advise me on what to do, how to handle things. But what I did know though is behind my back, she, she was also talking to my ex, you know, and so she would tell, I would tell her, man, I really need to get out of this marriage. I really need to go. And we actually went to a, to a furniture store and I was going to put my furniture on layaway. But I'm thinking this is between me and her because I know the kind of person I'm talking, I'm dealing with. I know he's been threatening me. So I didn't feel like I should share all my plans because I know who I'm dealing with. So anyway. What I didn't know is what she was sharing with him. And so when we went to the furniture store, he knew. And so he knew this is going to happen. She's going to leave. And I was planning to just move within the city, just be separate because obviously together we can't get along, but let's raise this child in our separate, from our separate homes. But when he got rid of that, that's when things went down, you know? So one day he just came from work and um, decided this is it. <laughs> and I didn't have the idea what to, that was the day. So he woke me up, he had water. Uh, I thought he was cooking tea. So he had water boiling in the stove. He said, I've made tea. So I'm thinking that water is tea. And so he had other plans. When I got in the kitchen, he took the water and, and the boiling water, so for a pool of boiling water and threw it to my face and chest. So basically that's my story and that's what's in here. Wow. I hope I can breathe. <laughs> I have not over spoken. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. I have a lot of questions, uh, but I'll ask you before we come to the many questions we have, um, I'll ask you to read like um, two or three pages from your book. Okay, so any, should any. I choose any? Just choose any, yeah. Hmm. Let's see. So, uh, so the truth is after that, I, I might just read this there where I was afraid that what, because I could see my skin peel off, I could see the skin on my chest peel off and I was worried about the outcome, the final outcome, and how, what will be the last outcome? What will I be scarred for life? So there's a chapter here, chapter 12, it says scarred for life or what? So um, this is after the actual 
uh, event. So the emergency room, um, the emergency room, they took me into, okay, they, um, it's a previous, from the previous page, the emergency room they took me into was crowded with like 10 doctors wearing white coats, a couple of nurses in scrubs and two policemen. Seeing all these doctors made it clear that the situation was worse, was more serious than I first thought. As soon as I was transferred to the bed in the room, to the only bed in the room, the doctors surrounded me. One assessed my face, a nurse poked me into the left arm, in my left arm as she started an IV while the doc, while the three doctors examined my chest. While I could, before I could breathe in and out, I was on morphine for the excruciating pain. Someone cleaned the bandages and bandaged my chest. Two doctors assessed my eyes and poured cold liquid into them. How bad is my face? I asked. So the doctor who was Assessing my face answered, you have suffered first degree burns in your face and left arm and second degree burns on your chest. Don't worry about your face. I'm confident you will fully recover. Before I could ask anything else, the doctor turned into my eyes interrupted. You are extremely lucky that the boiling water didn't get into your eyes. Had that occurred, it would, it would have caused instant blindness. Are you serious? I asked. Absolutely. At the moment, I realized just how much God loved me to have protected my sight. I was so grateful that God had um, to God that I didn't care about any scarring that might occur on my face. The doctors finished the initial assessment, hooked me on up to a monitor, then left the room. The two policemen, office, police officers, stepped closer one with a paper and a pen ready to jot down my statement. Before they could ask me any question, I requested that they please get my daughter to a safe place. I believe I was shaking as I spoke because one, one officer patted me lightly on my arm and told me not to worry, that my baby would be fine. The other officer left the room. Somehow, he sounded convincing enough that I stayed calm. As I narrated everything that had that happened in detail, he wrote it down. When he finished questioning me, a lady dressed in a gray pantsuit walked into the room. She introduced herself and said she was from the Child Protective Services, CPS. Immediately, my heart skipped. Um, immediately, I'm lost. My heart skipped a few beats. I was afraid of what else she would say. Do you have any family members who would help keep your daughter while you are in the hospital? No, but I have a friend that has been babysitting for me. She'll take her. I give her the, my friend's information. I'll visit your friend and determine if her home is suitable for your daughter. What if it's not, I asked. What will happen to her? In that case, we will place your baby in foster care until you are well enough to get her back. That was the last thing I needed to hear. I prayed a silent prayer to God not to allow that to happen. So that's a short chapter about what happened in the aftermath of the event. Wow. At this point, I'll ask, um, you're very brave, um, Stella. At this point, I'll ask whether there's anyone with questions um, for Stella. And as we are waiting, uh, my first question is, in your dating or going out, were there signs that you missed that this guy might be violent? Or now that you think about um, like how you guys began, um, did he suddenly change? Was there a trigger? Did you start earning more money or something? Or... No, the, the only thing I, I, I know when I look back is when we were, you know, that new to each other and he wanted to be serious. He could tell me about, you know, his growing up and how his family, his parents sometimes fought and how sometimes he was to go in between the mother and father to separate them from fighting, you know? And so uh, I, I said, wow, um, 
I hope you don't think you can hit someone. <laughs> you know, we discussed that, it came up. And I say, I hope you don't think it's okay to hit anybody because I, I cannot, uh, I cannot imagine anybody hitting me. So he said, you know what? I hated how my mom was being beaten. So why, how can I go back and hit my own wife? So even before we got serious, he, he expressed how it was hurtful to see him, uh, his father fight and beat up his mom. So I was sure this was not gonna happen, you know, because if he was the one separating them, I didn't expect it for him to come back and do the same thing. And so we discussed it and he said that would not, well, that would never happen. So I believed him. And so when we even uh, started hanging out, like starting living together, it never, there never was any sign of violence in him. He he's the kind of person that if he go out and stay out too late, and I feel bad about that, he will come and apologize initially. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Initially, but then after some time, he was like, uh, "You gotta get used to this. This is who I am." You know. While we were dating, he could even go out. He was he was with me the whole time, and so obviously he tricked me into believing he's not a party person. And so when I was in, oh, the party started, party after party after party, and don't ask a question, you know? So I can say that there, was, there were signs, but I feel like the fact that he saw abuse growing up, it, it could manifest at some point if he gets angry enough, you know? But I didn't expect it in the way it happened. I didn't. Wow. Okay, during that relationship, when he was angry, were there things that um, made him to cool down? Were there what? Were there things that you did that made him cool down? You did or you said that when he was like so hot tempered or he was about to do something bad, were there things that you did that maybe like toned him down? Oh, you know, kidding. you know, it's, it's very funny if I tell you this guy had no temper. He didn't have any temper. I would say that he's the kind of person that gets angry and acts. His, his actions were calculated. Everything he did was calculated. Everything he said was calculated. How, I don't know how to explain that, but I don't even remember, even when we, we were in, a, in a, maybe a serious argument, he would be the one to calm me down. <laughs> I would say maybe I was the one with other issues. <laughs> I probably was the one, but he never had the kind of anger that would react, you know, because even at that time, I was smart enough to, to gauge, uh, I can't go that far, he's too hot, I can't deal with this, you know? Mm -hmm. if I was the one that would get more upset because he's like, he, he seems so cool, even what he did, he seems so cool with it, and he will let me just talk it out, and then he'll be like, okay, it's not gonna happen again. For a while it wouldn't happen and then it will happen again. And so we were, it was a cycle, it was a cycle. So it was not like the kind of thing that uh, you get on his nerves so much that he can't control himself. He does not have anger issues, I, I can tell you. Even whatever he did, even the time he slapped me, he had arranged all that. That time he was drunk, I could give him that, you know, he was drunk, but even that, it was not because he was angry. It was because he could not get his way. Wow. You, you mentioned psychological abuse. Can you go deeper into that? Because we are used to physical abuse. What is uh, physiological abuse? So this is, this, is like, this is like when they attack you, they attack your identity. And, and you, most abusers do this because it's very rare, that's why I'm saying they may look like they don't know what they are doing, but it's calculated. They know what they are doing. So when they attack you, attack you in a way, hmm, see how do I put it? So they attack the way you look, you know what I'm saying? They might say something like, uh, you think you are, you are that beautiful? You think I can't get any other beautiful woman? You think this, you think, oh, you are too fat. You are too this, you are too that. They are attacking your, your self-esteem 
they are attacking who you are, your identity. And so what that does is it lowers your self-esteem. You know, you feel worthless. You feel like you are not good enough, even for this guy. And he used to say things like, um, I'm the only guy that can take care of you, things like that. And even though I didn't believe it at first, the more you hear something, it starts getting into your spirit and you start believing such nonsense, you know? And so what I know is, is he, that attack on my psychology and he would look at me and, and sense what area of myself I'm not confident about, you know? Say like, I'm overweight and, and he knows I feel bad about how much I weigh. So he would say things like, man, if you are not this fat, you would look great. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, things like that. So, yeah. and that hurts you, you know, you might not even be able, that is worse than a slap on the physical because a slap, I can heal the pain. But when he says something like that, it goes inside and it starts working on your, changing your mentality on how you see yourself how you carry yourself, things like that. So majority of the people, that's why it took so long for him to hit me. Before he hit me on the physical, he had slapped me big time in the mental, in the emotional. And so I felt like nobody. I felt worthless. I felt solo that, oof, I better stick to this one because clearly he's the only one that can handle, you know, I can deal with this person. He clearly says, I can't get another man. And you believe that stuff. You believe it. The more you hear it, you believe it. So that is the kind of abuse I'm talking about, mental and emotional abuse. Wow. Wow. You're, you're very brave. Um, her book is available on Amazon for $12.99. It's called The Abused Queen by Stella Kinama. And if we have any questions, you guys can just jump in and ask those very questions. My other question is, uh, now that you know him a little bit better, uh, what was he afraid of? I know it's a serious question, but in your own thinking, what was he afraid of? Well, the, I mean, when I analyzed the whole, the whole situation, there was, there was this deep, deep fear of rejection. You know what I'm saying? He, he kept talking about a previous uh, relationship that he had and this girl left him for a, I think for a friend and he never overcame that. And so he felt like, first of all, it took a toll on his self-esteem big time mm -hmm. that he never felt good enough. And even when I came into his life, he felt like I, he, I'm too good for him. And that's part of the reason why he had to attack my self-esteem. So I, I don't feel like I'm, I'm better than the way he's saying, he's seeing the situation is, man, she, she can leave me any time because he's been left before, you know? So he felt like the only way I can hold on to this one is if I, if I push her down. And so all these abuse, all these words that, that are hurtful, all this psychological abuse is to push you down. So you feel like uh, you can't even try anything else out there. There's nothing better for you. So you better stay here. But the worst thing is, even though he feel like I'm too good for him, he's not trying to do better, you know, so he can keep me. He's trying to push me down and beat me up. You know what I'm saying? So I would say the biggest, the biggest problem was fear of rejection. For him, it was so obvious. And I kept, I had to keep reassuring him. Why do you feel like I will leave? Why do you feel like I am going somewhere? If you don't want me to go, then look at the things we are arguing about and fix them. I don't have to go anywhere. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But this fear is usually deep rooted inside. And it takes someone to really work on himself. It had to be him working on himself. Even if he had Miss America, he wouldn't have been satisfied because it's a fear that is within him. You know what I'm saying? And I also had my insecurities, you know, but it, it, they were on a di different levels. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So me, when I get hurt, I know how to get out. That's all I know. I, I, it's not working. Let's leave the situation. For him, it's 
hold on and keep. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so that that would have been the biggest flaw I saw in him. Wow. Any any other questions uh, from the members? Mine is just an observation, like what Stella, uh, one of the things Stella says, I advocate for some women. I take like women who've come into the country to court and, and stuff like that. And one of the things when I was fairly new to the American system is, you know, the way you're seated in court, you can hear everybody's everybody's case and there was this lady who was telling the judge or was, the judge was presented in the way the lady was abused and she mentioned that some of the things Stella mentioned and I was like wait a minute is that abuse like are you serious somebody calling you stupid or you whatever is like you can actually take somebody to court for mentally abused. that was like mind-boggling to me because back at home so many women in the village are told by their husband, Quenda Uko, you know, sit to there and they still continue in the marriage, but that does something to you. It wears down your self-esteem and also brings you down as a person. So a lot of domestic, most of domestic violence, people think it's like the heating and, you know, the physical part, but it's more so to do also with how it affects you mentally. So thank you, Stella, for sharing that. You're welcome. Thank you, Jane, for that question or observation. Any other questions on, on her book? Can you tell us a little bit more about the medical part of it? How long did it take for you to fully heal? Uh, do you have any pictures uh, when you're in hospital or uh, how did you feel when you're in hospital? Afraid, <laughs> very afraid. And, oh my God, I was lost, confused, in disbelief. I can't even say all the words, but it was mostly a shock, you know, because man, I didn't see this coming. I didn't see it coming. I knew he could be aggressive because obviously he hit me once, but I didn't see that kind of thinking in him. But then looking back, I start seeing, wait, he was actually that kind of a person, but I guess I had estimated what he would do, what he could do. So I, when I was in the hospital room, of course it was very, very scary especially because I didn't know what would happen with my baby. This is um, a picture of, uh, that's a picture, I think it was on the second day. This was on, I don't even know if, if you guys can see anything, but my face swore up and my, the chest started peeling that very time. Even in the hospital, they had to take some of the skin out to put the right, you know, out ointment and antibiotics and stuff. But my my face, they put the ointment, they put the whatever medicine. I still, I wish I took the names, but they took the medicine and put it on me. But then the skin swelled up, and the, you know how when you get burnt, there's water on top, and then eventually the skin you can take it off. Yeah, that's how my face became. I don't, um, I thought I had a picture of all those clearing. I don't know where I put it, but this, um, there's a picture if you go on my Facebook page where all the skin has peeled off, especially right here, right here. And it's just by God's grace that I do look the way I look today that I healed completely because I never went through any surgery. They didn't do any skin grafting. They just put, applied, gave me that ointment to, um, to apply. My chest got effect, infected after a couple of days and I had to go back and stay in the hospital for, uh, for two or three days because they had, they had an infection. But my face, when it finally dried up, and the skin peeled off. I continued putting the ointment they gave me. 
And by God's grace, that was November 22nd or 26th when it happened. And by December, uh, the, the, the skin had peeled off and started growing brand new skin. And I could put some makeup and go somewhere, but my chest was still, I had still to put some t-shirt underneath my clothes because the chest took some time to heal. Wow. Uh, Tabi, you have a question? Tabitha, you have a question? You can unmute. Hi, Stella. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I'm just here to encourage you that uh, I think most of the women, they got scars, such scars that you have of abuse. Um, when you are talking, uh, I came late, but I'm meeting this case to mine, of which I've, maybe I've shared with some other people, but um, I just want to encourage you that you are still a queen and you remain a queen. And despite what you are abused, God had a good plan for you, not for destruction. And that's why you are never distracted. And uh, there are so many women who, you know, they, they, they suffered in silence. I suffered in silence until I came to America. And to me, I may not have a book, but I want to tell you that I live with someone who abused me, but there is something that God, you know, when you abuse, there is a story. God, God is always... Um, looking over you i was not you know i knew like i would die in abusive relationship i had a very hard time until today um that's when um, maybe i'll get my daughter but it was a very pain for me so when i hear your story it gives an encouragement to me and thank you for sharing and you are still a queen walk like a queen and you know you deserve the best thank you thank you so much i appreciate that any other questions from members and as we're waiting um what do you tell your daughter as she grows up um are you ready for another relationship or is that door completely closed and what do you <laughs> think about men <laughs> Wow. Um, as far as my daughter, she's she's eight. Um, she has questioned things about, you know, why uh, other kids have a father with them or if they are not together with the mom, they visit, you know, and I had to look for the, the subtle way, the sub -close, easiest way to explain that it's not possible for her for now, you know, but it I have not told her about this. I feel she's not ready, mm -hmm. but she, I tell her small, small details just to make her understand that it's not like I'm withholding her from experiencing the love of the father, but it's, it, I tell her God will make a way when it's time, you know, because after all these, it's now a court situation. It's now, um, a war in the law, in the, it's a situation also, you know, and the government had to intervene. And so there was laws that were put in place so that they will protect me and her. And so um, it's tough to tell a kid that, you know, but by the grace of God, she took it, she, she takes it very well and she believes that when Time is right, God will give her uh, another father. <laughs> She's not even looking forward to meeting that one because somehow she can tell the vibe in between us is not that great. So uh, that being said, I do have, I don't have any problem with men at all. You know, I don't have any problem. I know every man is unique in their own way. 
And just because one of them was that mean, doesn't mean all men are like that. And so I, I understand just like us women, we, we are dealing with different issues. And so I cannot generalize. Of course, at first I was very upset and I treated men very badly. I didn't want them to come any close to me. But after healing, I went through the process of healing. Um, I can say I'm in a better place now that I can, I, I look at person individual by individual. I don't just judge people generally saying they are abusive, they are dogs, they are, that is obviously very wrong. So I know that the key is to let the healing happen. And even my sister that said she went through um, abuse, I, I hear in her voice that she's confident, she's not like talking in, in regret, she's not talking, she can see God in her situation because whatever we go through in life, God is still with us. And if God allowed it to happen, there's a purpose behind it. And so just even for me to write this book, I was not trying to make money. I did make some money, but that was not the intention. The intention was to bring this awareness so that people like me that didn't know that they were being abused can finally open their eyes and they don't have to wait till such an outcome because we have even had people die in these situations. Many, many families have lost. Someone will come and just kill the wife, kill the children and kill themselves. We've had many situations like that. So we don't have to go there. So I, I feel obligated to tell my story that way it can liberate somebody else it can give someone direction. It can show you where you are because sometimes you stay in a marriage. You don't know what will happen tomorrow, but you feel because before this happened, man, there was a certain groom in the air, like doom area. Like you can feel something is going to happen. Something tragic is going to happen. I literally knelt down and I said, God, whatever is about to happen, you have to protect me and protect my child because I could feel within my spirit something is about to happen. And so I saw then God that he created a way. He made a way. The way might look like this. It was very painful. It was very tough to get over that, but he still made a way. It is a way of escape for me and my child. So to be here alive and well, and be able to talk about my story without any bitterness, without anger, without revenge, looking for revenge. I see it as a blessing. I see it as a blessing. So I don't generalize men. I don't generalize anybody, even women or anybody. I know everyone has issues they have to deal with. And so I took my time and I thank God because I can say that I have healed from this situation completely. And now I had to work on the issues that led me there. Because for me, even to be attracted to this kind of a person meant I had my own issues. You know what I'm saying? We attract who we are. So for him to be so insecure and me to get in his ship, that means I also had my insecurities. And I knew that. And so I, um, after that, I've taken time. I stopped dating. I just focused on healing and working on me to where my crushed self-esteem, because by the time I left this marriage, man, I had no, zero self-esteem. So I had to build it back up again to where I can feel like a woman again. I can feel good again. I can feel I'm a queen, like that lady said, I'm a queen. Now I don't even have to want anybody to tell me, oh, you're beautiful, oh, you're this, you're this. I know who I am because I believe what God says I am. So. I took time and if anybody has gone through that process, I encourage you, take some time away from dating because if you go to the next relationship, that hurt, you will produce the, most likely the same results because now you are angry, you are mad at the previous, age. even this person, even if they are good, they might not be able to, to you know, you might not be able to go ahead with it. So that, um, was that the question you asked or did I go on my own way? No, no, you answered correctly. My other question before I let the other guys talk is uh, what triggers do you have? Uh, what makes you cry? Uh, and did you seek therapy or are you from advocate of therapy for people who go through abusive uh, relationships? Um, 
Well, of course I <laughs> I do. I used especially when I was uh, fresh from the relationship and after that situation because it happened in the kitchen area, even anybody that came up around me, I didn't allow any men in the kitchen. <laughs> like, don't cook for me, don't worry about cooking, let me cook. Because I was afraid, uh, what are you gonna do this time, you know? So there was that fear and eventually I had to grow with trust, you know, because now obviously that had been violated. So that was a trigger. Uh, if I see a man getting like, like they are mad, I'll be like, mm -mm -mm -mm. you know, do that around me, you know, I'll just walk out because I, I don't know what you do when you're mad, you know. So that was that was uh, something I had. And like I said, through the healing process, now I started seeing it's that my trust was violated. My, the way I look at people was violated. And so I had to grow back, grow back all these uh, things so that I can see people as people again, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. not as animals that they are coming. I do advocate for uh, therapy if you can afford it. If you, uh, like now, because my case was, the state took over my case. When you are the victim, you have a lot of rights. You have a lot of help. And so the state gives you a lawyer, they give you uh, a counseling, they can actually offer counseling, they can offer, offer shelter, they can offer a lot of things when you are the victim. So I would advise if, if you, anybody is going through that or if you know somebody that's going on, encourage them to take all advantage of all these, um, all these good things that the government offers. In America, man, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing that they take care of the victims, they take care of their children until you be able to start on your own feet. So. I did have uh, that offer to go into the uh, counseling and they said somebody over, but then I moved from that state and I came here to Houston. And so it was tough just starting over with a baby alone. So I didn't get the enough time. I didn't have time to go for therapy and all that. So I would say just God healed me. I mean, in his own way. I used to listen to a lot of uh, um, preaching just to encourage, to feel the courage and hope back into my life because that was gone, you know? So yes, do go for counseling, do go for therapy, especially if it's offered or if you can afford it. And I really encourage that because healing is vital. Healing is very, very important. If you're gonna live a good life after that, you have to go through the healing process. Talk to someone. And usually because we don't have uh, people to talk with, around us, talk to someone who can offer that help. I'm still getting a lot of questions. Uh, there's a time you mentioned he slapped you and beat you up and then you went back again. What made you go back again? I'll, I find a lot of our couples, even after the man has done uh, the worst crime ever uh, to them, they still go back together. Uh, what makes uh, women or men go back to each other uh, or to abusive uh, relationships, knowing um, how lethal this can be? Uh, well, I mean, the biggest thing would be because they've been working on your self-esteem. You don't feel good, you know, and they have told you over and over again that you can't make it without me. You, you're going to have a hard time. And then when that happens, there is a cycle of abuse where they, they abuse you and then they go into switch, night to a honeymoon phase, they switch talk you. And then when you come uh, or you get back in, they start, they start building up. You can see they are building up the, the, the same anger and, and then they'll go to abuse again. It's a cycle. And so usually when the abuse happens, women leave, people leave, even men who are being abused, they leave. But this person realizes, oh, they left. And so they go after them. So when he came after me, and men, they will do whatever it takes. They will buy you a car if you need, if you, they can do that. They will buy whatever it takes, that honeymoon phase, so they can get you back into the, into the, into their, you know, into their hands. And so when you finally go in, then they start coming back into their real selves. So it's a cycle that continues and this woman or this person that is abused keep going back 
because first of all, you have your have, your self esteem is so low, or there is no self esteem at all that you feel like you can actually handle life by yourself. And especially when there are kids involved, you feel like, man, like how do I even raise these kids alone? So you feel like whatever they offer, even if it comes with abuse, is good enough. But that's just because you have not understood who you really are. You have not, um, you don't have enough courage and believe that you can do life without this person. So you keep going back and keep going back and most people die in that kind of cycle, you know, because it doesn't get any better. In fact, it gets worse. It gets worse. Like you can see, he slapped me. And when I went back, look what happened. This is not even a slap. This is close to murder. You know what I'm saying? So it could have been anything. It could have been murder. If there was a weapon in the house, uh, I probably wouldn't be here today. So uh, the reason why people go there is because there's been years and years of, of showing you how worthless you are, how much you can do without them, how much you need them, how much he, and threats too, just like he was threatening me. So you are afraid of so many things. And then our culture puts this um, stigma about single, being single. And so they, they, you have that fear of being labeled a single mom, a divorcee, a single dad, a divorcee, you know? So you stay in this situation uh, because of fear of the opinions of people. But the last thing is, if the worst happened and you end up dying in this situation or you end up in the situation I was in, the very people that was talking, they will still talk. So I'll say, you know, get, get enough courage, pray for God to give you guidance, take all the help you can get and get out because it's for your own good. Very good. And for your children's good. Very good, that's very brave of you. Uh, any other questions from the members? Wanjiro, Agnes, Jane, Tabby? Or oh, words of encouragement? Her book is uh, The Abuse Queen by Stella Kinama. It's available on Amazon for $12.99. Um, uh, you can get it there anytime. I think I have a copy at home. Um, any other questions? Uh, you can type it using the chat tool. Uh, there's a message you did very good. Um, I've actually met Stella in person. She'd come for a presentation here in law. And uh, that's where I got to buy her book. And she sold quite a number of books uh, in law. And I can see a lot of people suffer in silence and such tools such as books, presentations, uh, even maybe one day you'll get to do a movie or a skit or a drama, uh, who knows? Amen. Someone could be helped, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, what's your parting shot if you don't have any questions? Um, um, I would say, I would say that um, for, for anybody that would be going through this, that you, you'd rather be single and alive, you know? Single and alive is way better than married and dead, you know? So, and sometimes because we saw our parents stayed in such situations and they stayed saying that uh, it's because of my children, it didn't do us any favor because look at the person that grew up in such a situation. They take that as their default. They take that as their default setting. So when they don't get their way, they do what daddy did. They do what mommy did. And so when we raise children in such situation, we are putting issues in them that it will take years, if ever, to get out of them. And so I would say, I know we want the best for our kids. We take them to the best schools. We give them the best food. No parent want their children to eat McDonald's day in, day out. We want to give, feed our children healthy food. Just like that, be careful what you're putting in your psyche of your child. What do they observe at home? How do they see your relationship? 
if it's not up to par, you either fix it or give it a break. I don't encourage divorce, but I encourage, especially if there's physical abuse and they, you know these signs of abuse are in your home, separate for a while and try to work this thing out. Because showing this, your kids this, they will take that as normal. And they will grow thinking, oh, my mom was abused and she stayed. So it's normal for me to stay. So even this guy, when he slapped me, he didn't expect me to leave because his mom had been abused and abused and abused and she stayed. So when I left, he could not actually believe it. What do you mean leave because of one slap? And I knew women, actually the reason I went back is because people around me who are married were like, you mean you left because of one slap? I get beaten at least twice a week and I'm still with him. And I was shocked, like people actually take this as normal. And so why would it not continue? If we're going to stop abuse forever, we have to get our kids in a healthy environment. If they're gonna pick it up somewhere, they will not pick it up from us as the parents. And so I would rather be alone. Like I am single, it's not like I wouldn't have gotten married so far, but I am afraid of what I'm exposing my child to. I'm very, very afraid of exposing her to the wrong and toxic environment especially coming from such an environment, you know? So we have to uh, be very careful what we are letting our children digest emotionally and mentally, because it will affect them for the rest of their life. We may take them to Harvard, but their psyche is, is messed up. They cannot keep a relationship because they, they know abuse, they know how to hit, and when you hit, you know the situation, you go to jail. So whether they went to Harvard and they have a record, it's not gonna do them any good. So I suggest we be brave enough to face this situation head on, you know, and if we can't, if, if it becomes dangerous, be brave enough to say, I choose to leave even if I'm alone. It takes courage though, it takes a lot of courage. Oh, thank you, Stella, for that wonderful presentation. I still have a lot of questions. <laughs> Maybe I'll just shoot one more. Uh, is it true that uh, abuse uh, runs across all cultures, or is it like people who are not? Is it like is it more pre, uh, prevalent in the colored communities or poor communities as compared to more educated white folks? Uh, you'll be shocked because abuse is everywhere across all um, races, colors, uh, financial situation, e economically, it doesn't choose. There are people who are billionaires right now, yet they live in abuse. So it doesn't choose what color. Of course, there are factors that increase the chances of abuse, especially when there's strain money strain, that can in, increase the chances of abuse. Even when money gets too much and there's obviously a lift between how are we gonna spend this money, it, it can be prompted by anything, but it doesn't choose among, of course now what we hear is um, black community, how they hurt, they kill each other and all that, but abuse does not choose. What abuse is happening in, in America, is happening in Asia, is happening in Africa. Abuse is everywhere and it cuts across all races, all economical status, you know, it does not choose. So even though there are factors, there are, there are obviously factors that increase the chances of abuse, then um, there's not really special people that get abused more, you know, or, or escape abuse correct so it's that's why that's why it's important because it's an internal thing it's an internal situation however you grew up you have to fix that if you saw your parents fight then you have to sit down somewhere and realize wait that was not right even though my mom stayed it was not right for my father to hit my mom so it's the statistics say uh children that grew up watching this they are 10 times more likely to abuse their spouses so that's, that's already has put you on a, on a very high level of chances that you abuse someone, you know? So it takes inner work 
I have to say that it takes inner work, you working on your issues. If you have temper, work on it. If you have anger issues, work on it. Whatever it is, if you, if when you drink alcohol, you get aggressive, stop drinking. You have to know yourself and work on your issues to avoid this thing from happening over and over because it's a generational thing. You see, it happened to his mother and father, probably had happened before then, and he's continuing. And now if I stayed and my child grew up watching that, it would have been continued in the next generation. So if we have to put a comma and a full stop on this situation, we have to be willing to work on ourselves. Uh, thank you, Stella. I don't know whether we have- Stella, uh, Go ahead. just one more question to Stella. Stella, what, how do you handle abuse? Because some cultures uh, accept abuse, right? There are some mm -hmm. cultures that allow you to slap a woman mm -hmm. once or twice and yeah, to discipline her. How do, you, how do you approach abuse in that situation where the culture accepts, even if you went home or you went to you know, the elders, that is acceptable, that's the norm? Well, we, we, we just have to educate them. A woman does not need to be disciplined, you know? And I know some of the cultures from our forefathers, they grew up thinking oh, a woman is my property and I can do whatever I want with her. We, it's, it's more education, times have changed. And those women took it because they didn't know any better. But now we know we are just as, as human beings as men are, it doesn't make us any better or any worse. We are human beings. You discipline a child growing up, but when that child is grown, you, you're not trying to discipline a grown woman. Disciplining a grown woman is abuse, period. It is abuse. And so someone has to open their mouth and tell them, listen, what you are doing is wrong and it has to stop. And of course, it takes a lot to change something that has been done for ages and for generations. And so it, it will take a lot of talking, a lot of explaining, to explain to them why you should not hit a woman, why you should not discipline her, she don't need discipline. A conversation is enough to tell someone, uh, I don't like this and let's not do that again. I, it, there's not, no culture that should do that. It's abuse, no matter who does it. Even when the president do it, it's abuse, period. I hope I answered your question, I'm sorry. You, you made me think of the former president, Kibaki's wife, you know, when they <laughs> call a press conference, I think that was also abuse. <laughs> the, the wife. And they're also educated and rich class when you're talking about uh, class, uh, class abuse. Gigi, you, uh, you came in a bit late. Uh, any questions before we let Stella go? Okay, I guess not ready. There's a comment right here. Uh, mine is to thank you, Stella, for sharing your life experience with us. I sure will buy the book. Um, our time is um, yeah, our time is far much spent. Uh, we had uh, Stella discussing a book, The Abused Queen. She's based out of uh, Houston, uh, Texas. Uh, her book is available on Amazon for $12.99. And uh, she read us a few, a few pages, uh, very interesting. But above all, I'm glad you are able to get back your power by getting off that relationship and also writing that book. Um, and now you're empowering other people, not just women, but also men, uh, especially in our communities. Once again, thank you very much for availing your time and choosing to spend the evening with us. And I'm sure we'll uh, catch up on some other time. Otherwise, thank you everybody for logging in tonight. Uh, we meet every Tuesdays um, at eight o'clock. Uh, God bless you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.